Now to a public relations disaster for Britain's Prince Andrew. In a rare interview with the BBC, he tried to distance himself from convicted sex criminal Jeffrey Epstein. It was for the first time that he spoke on camera. There is new fallout from the new Prince Andrew interview about his connection to Jeffrey Epstein. Buckingham Palace fighting back and fighting hard as the sex abuse scandal against Prince Andrew intensifies. A controversy shaking Britain's royal family. Prince Andrew accused in a lawsuit of inappropriate relations with an underage girl. He also drew into question whether or not the photograph the two of them together was in fact fake. So the prince's answers only raised more questions. Unless you've like, worked in an environment where you're 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 mixing with upper echelons, we're going to call them the upper echelons of society. I'm not saying they're any better than you or me because they're clearly not. A lot of them aren't. But I'm talking about the super high net worth people and the government officials and presidents and prime ministers and all these people that you know that they've got a different outlook on life than me and you. Not oh, we're just normal people. But that environment is 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 a very a very strange environment in terms of the way the upper class perceive right and wrong. Because clearly they're running circles where they can get what they want whenever they want. Um, and this is the point of what's happened with Epstein. Epstein is a, clearly a, a, an individual that enjoys power and enjoys or enjoyed power and enjoyed, you know, manipulating and, and child sex exploitation for his own benefits and sharing that out by the looks of it with others. Um, and, and But never thought that anything was going to come of it. And I think part of that that confidence would have come with being a friend of a member of the royal family. The, the times and the things that I've said and will tell you, I was in company with other police officers. So it's not like I was on my own and it cannot be corroborated. What I'm saying is it, the officers that I was with are too frightened to come forward to corroborate it, but they're certainly not going to come forward and deny it. I think when you look at Prince Andrew, there's not a lot of people out there who are actually telling the public or telling people what he is really like uh, as the person off duty. People see him and other members of the royal family on the telly, waving and smiling. But behind closed doors, certainly from my experience with Prince Andrew, it's a totally different kettle of fish. It was always going to be uh, a disaster for a simple reason. When you're not telling the truth and you cannot explain yourself in a way that isn't sinister, then you have to lie. And if you lie, especially in this situation, then your lies better be pretty damn bloody good and you better be pretty damn bloody bright. And unfortunately for him, neither of those is true. And therefore, um, it's clear that he has no defense from what he's accused of. I mean, once we are into situations where the defense from uh, having sex with an underage girl is not sweating, not going out in London without a shirt and tie and going to a pizza restaurant, I mean... It's crazy, and that's an, an interesting point which some people have made. These people don't go anywhere in public without a security um, operation, which logs the movements. So if Prince Andrew um, can account for his movements to prove that what's said is not true, then in that BBC interview, he would have said, well, just hold on a second. Here's the logs. Everything he said in that interview, or a lot of it, was just rubbish, complete rubbish. First and foremost, uh, he was lying. Um, and, I, and I detailed this in the interview I gave with Ian um, in relation to the travel arrangements and the Pizza Express story. Well, if that was a genuine um, sort of visit he was going on with, with his daughter, which is another member of the royal family, so you've got at least two, maybe three members of the royal family, you don't just turn up to Pizza Hut and queue up or Pizza Express and queue up in the queue, do you? 
what would have happened is you'd have had a protection officer would have gone down there who would have booked the tables they would have been cordoned off and then that would have been ready to go so they'd have been at the car straight to the booth they would have done checks they would have spoken to the manager of the pizza express and saying listen we're bringing the principal down here so that everyone would have known what the situation was what would have happened is there would have been a record of that of that visit officers entry the notebooks uh, uh maybe a security assessment they would have done on that um because it was a, an actual visit and as I, I explained the reasons why they would have done that um but those those notes um would have un, would, they can be kept between six and 30 years so there's potentially a, a chance that there would have been notes to, that would have corroborated prince andrew's story but then that doesn't mean to say he wasn't in tramps nightclub four hours later so if a member is such as prince andrew because he's like one of the main members of the royal family is going abroad what would happen is it would all be pre-planned so the royal protection command would contact the local police force um which would have been the new york police i, I should imagine but also uh, they've probably got government protection i think they have government protection officers because they were, i'm sure they were with prince andrew at the Ep on the epstein visit is subsequently transpired so what would happen is we would we would uh give them uh, the address of where Prince Andrew was staying when we're coming, you know, the team's coming. Um, and they were doing necessary checks on the premises and the people within those premises. So they would check the freehold to see who owns it to make sure it's not, I don't know, a gangster or, you know, whatever else. And in this case, it was <laughs> Mr. Epstein. So obviously they would have checked out Mr. Epstein's details, had Andrew had given them. If he hadn't, his details would have still come up on the freehold for the property. So obviously they would have checked out Mr. Repstein in their police computer and it would have come up that he was a convicted child sex offender. So the security stroke threat assessment that the Americans would have done and passed back to us would have noted all that in there, would have said that this is not a suitable address for a member of the British royal family to stay at for the reasons listed. And obviously they would have explained Epstein and, and whatever else, the convictions. So that information would have then been passed to Prince Andrew directly through his personal protection officer, or it could have been done through the commander. And they would have basically said, uh, we advise you not to go um, to, to the, stay with this, with this gentleman in these premises. So when I talk about paperwork trail, you've had emails back and forth. Um, you probably may have even had uh, written letters back and forth, but you certainly would have had emails from the Americans back to us with their advice um, and then there probably would have been a security meeting with Royal Protection. What I mean by that is they were, the commander would have sat down with the officers, protection officers, and said, right, this is the report. This is what we've got. Uh, we've analysed it. We need to advise Purple 4-1, which is Prince Andrew's code name, uh, against visiting this person. That would have been done. Anyone who says that would not have been done is, is lying uh, or don't know anything about security. Um, so that information would have been passed to Prince Andrew. So Prince Andrew would have said no i'm going and refused to listen to the advice given that would have been noted on the notes by the royal protection command that he refused well why did you refuse when you was told clearly because he for some reason he felt the need to go over and in his own words which was just rubbish four days to say goodbye to someone you know i'll be quite frank that if that was anyone else a normal person yeah and they found out they're a friend of theirs was a convicted child sex offender. You'd ring them up, say, delete my number and fuck right off and put the phone down, wouldn't you? Exactly. It's as simple as that. That is the sum total of the conversation you would have. Because I've seen him sweating and, I, and again, I've documented it and I've, and I've spoke about this, that um, he would come out in the garden and play golf, hit his golf balls up the garden, um, which on one occasion, it was... Uh, it was an occasion where I needed to be on the phone and I couldn't because he'd come out the garden entrance and was now uh, with his with his protection officer who was carrying his golf bag. Prince Andrew was playing, it was a really hot day on that day and he was, he was whacking golf balls up the end of the garden and he was sweating profusely. If you talk to anybody about liars, they come up with extraordinary details and anybody who says, well, I don't sweat much, it's just really weird stuff. The biggest problem for Andrew and the royal family and is that it's public. It's not that he hangs with pedos or has, has, has hung out with pedos and became incredibly friendly with pedos or, is, or may potentially be involved with the trafficking of, of young people. It's the fact that it's exposed to the public gaze. That's the problem. Because there's so many pictures out there 
In fact, there's more pictures of him partying than there is at, at charity events, which is what I've said on my Twitter feed as well. You know, he says, oh, I wasn't so much of a party anymore. Well, let's go back through the... If you, all you've got to do, uh, Your Highness, is go on Google and, and Google yourself and you'll find a lot more pictures of you at parties than you are at, you know, charity events. But obviously, Prince Andrew spent four days apparently saying goodbye. Now, the problem he's got as well is to say... Um, that he did it out of respect or whatever to go over there. Well, what he was about, so honourable. That was it. The on, did the honourable thing. But I'm sorry, you, what you just did there was trashed every survivor of child sex trafficking, child sex exploitation, and you know any survivor of child sex abuse, which gives you an indication as to what his mind's, which was important there, his mindset, how how he ticks, how he thinks, because now you know that he's very careless and he doesn't understand about human life. So that shows you that it doesn't care. I can't see how we can recover from this. Um, you know, one, once you have cut somebody off in terms of royal duties, because he can't explain a relationship with a, a horrific paedophile and procurer of children and trafficker of children, unless some, at some point he can say, here's the proof, I, I, I didn't know anything about it, which which ain't going to come. I can't see how you can justify saying, OK, it's long enough now, come back. Because don't think people would have it. He he wanted to tell in person uh, Mr. Epstein that he shouldn't have, he couldn't have contact with him anymore because he had engaged in conduct that was unbecoming. Unbecoming? Mr. Epstein had been convicted of sex crimes involving children. Virginia said that he was in an orgy with um, underage girls. Um, so there's massive public pressure on the FBI to do something about this. Yeah. Supposedly, because we've got these stories in the tabloids and in the news and we don't know what's real, what's not real. Supposedly, Virginia is the target of an FBI investigation right now, but Prince Andrew is not. But the lawyers of the victims are requesting that they speak to him. And if he touches down on American soil, he's going to get subpoenaed um, into court and all this stuff. He's going to, all this legal stuff is going to get thrown at him. I mean, what I'd say is, and this is potentially a key, right, to the fact that he's not going to be subject to any subpoenas or any indictments, is because if you're, if you're involved in an investigation or you're being investigated, you're knowingly being investigated, would you go on telly and talk about it, knowing that you could be potentially indicted. You wouldn't, unless you knew that you weren't. The reason being is, you keep your mouth shut until the investigation is is over and done with. You don't go on telly and give an explanation, because all that's all you're doing is you're giving information to the opposing team that they can then use against you when they actually do decide to arrest you. And so, well, you said this, and this isn't correct, because that that interview he gave, there was I pulled it apart myself. All right, um, and. For him to have been that, with legal advisors, he would have had a legal team around him. And they would have, or, or bet he, if, if they thought there was a possibility of any indictments coming his way, they'd have shut the idea of him doing the interview down. So he must have had some guarantees that this isn't going anywhere for him to, to publicly speak. Any lawyer worth his weight in gold would tell his client, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, because potentially you, there's an investigation that you may be involved in. But obviously he's been told, he's been given a guarantee from whoever that, you know, that nothing's going to happen with this. The people assume that the royal family are somehow these kind of like, heart, you know, she, like the queen is some harmless old lady with her handbag and everything and her blue rinse or whatever, you know. But this is an incredibly, obviously an incredibly powerful household and it's not even just the family at the core of it but it's all of you know the people around it who enable the house of windsor to function per se so they all have vested interest and they have a vested interest in andrew not going down because if andrew goes down that is problematic for the whole family and, and so when you hear for example just i'll quickly say this when you hear a spokesman said or a close friend said no there is no close friend that's the press office putting out a you know, a, a, a narrative out there for you to soak up. They're even saying, oh, that's a doctored picture. That wasn't him. He wasn't there. Of course, because this is what the establishment does. 
So what, what I have definitely learned over the last few weeks is one, the newspapers are, are deliberately writing fake headlines about Andrew being estranged from the royal family. How does that benefit the royal family? It, it benefits the royal family because it makes it look as though they're taking paedophilia or anybody associated with them seriously and that is an absolute nonsense the royal family have never taken paedophilia seriously in fact andrew is just one of them by being mates with a paedophile because that's what they've been doing for an awful long time you talked about jimmy savile last jimmy time. savile uh, Dickie Mountbatten, Prince Philip's uncle, you know, Bishop Ball, um, who was Prince Charles's mate and a, a renowned paedophile. So these people have no problems being around abusers. Andrew is not being ostracised at all. It is to make it look like the royal family are taking this most seriously and honour you, the citizens. No, you don't. Because Andrew showed absolutely no remorse whatsoever. They obviously analyzed that and then said all right we've got to put out now that we're disciplining him yes. to show that yes. we take yes. this seriously yes. to get the public back in our favor absolutely what um has um been done in terms of the queen cutting off andrew is kind of presented as the queen acting decisively because of you know things that andrew was possibly involved in and all that stuff in other words, the Queen kind of cares. We mustn't, you mustn't have done this. You shouldn't have done this and all this stuff. No, no. What she's saying is, Andrew, you shouldn't have got caught, right? Which is a very different thing. Because you'll remember that recently an ABC television anchor, what we call a presenter or news pre uh, presenter, um, was um, on a live mic being filmed, but it wasn't for air she was talking to people in the gallery i think and it was leaked by uh, or to project veritas and she described um that she had the epstein story three years earlier uh and she had clinton she had prince andrew and all this and abc wouldn't air it and one of the reasons she says in this leaked uh, video was threats from the royal family so the royal family couldn't give a damn about abused kids they give a damn about getting caught being involved with them the royal family always need the support of the public always and they get it unconditionally generally and, and still i mean the fact is is if 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 half of the things had happened with any other family that we know that's happened with the royal family they would they would cease to exist as an entity so the royal family are very cherished within the established england that that's the reality of it and the british people by and large want to believe that the royal family are sort of pure creatures right we have this idea you know we know that we have this idea that anybody who's been through a sort of public school system we automatically assume that they must be less of a criminal than somebody who's been to the local comp we do that that's in our culture we've been raised to believe this notion and so that's why they keep getting away with it so no andrew has not been ostracized he's not been alienated he's very much in the bosom of the family tell you who gave away the clue was fergie because fergie made very clear that not only does she not care about any victims but that her only concern is for andrew and why because she's at the trough like all of them and, and i'll tell you something else that one of the editors said to me is that the only thing they're upset about at this moment in time is that beatrice won't get her big wedding like eugenie did mm. that's the only thing that they're really concerned about at this moment in time and some of the pr effort is to enable you know them to clear the way for that the most important thing is to maintain the firm and that's what they're doing so that is by any means necessary so i don't think that i'm saying there is is 100 what i saw and what i heard nothing more nothing less so Prince Andrew, um, his main, his main sort of uh, problem was with with us was the amount of females that would enter the palace and not follow security procedure. And as I said to you, that that is an issue for the reason of that, because you do get people coming up to the front of the palace and saying, "I'm here for the Duke," and they're they're actually quite mad, and they're not. So how do we know? One time a person's come up and says, "I'm here for Prince Andrew," but they're not really there, and we just let them in. Who's going to end up walking the beat in Brixton? It's going to be me.
Because there wasn't any that I would say were, were younger than that. Um, they were definitely in their twenties, and they were definitely going. Definitely, some of them were fifteen, twenty years uh, younger than than Prince Andrew. It's obviously uh, my, it's not just my opinion; it's the opinion of other officers that I work with. That he obviously had a taste for younger women. We just get a call. There's a taxi coming with two female guests for Prince Andrew. Same protocol. Just open the gates and let the taxi straight through into the quad. So we had to go and open the quad, the gates of the quad because they're shut at night for security. So open the gates, taxi pulls up. There's two scantily clad females. Um, you know, well, I'm, I emphasise the word scantily clad. They had short skirts, very low cut tops, heavy makeup, and they were drinking cans of coke, giggling and laughing. Um, now, the reason I'm picking up on that is because they're coming to see a member of the royal family as opposed to going to a nightclub, which is a slightly different sort of, uh, you know, uh, place you would go when you're dressed in that sort of attire so it just it just seemed out of place for us and my colleague um he was of the opinion that it was it was late it was a night and we're police officers we have a laugh and a giggle you know and his opinion was they were prostitutes and they looked like prostitutes or they looked like we started off they looked like prostitutes from the chelsea harbour club because apparently there's a, a, a i don't know a high class escort agency running around that area he's not going down I doubt they'll even be able to get him up for a police interview. And that was the other thing. That was the other thing. Why was he being interviewed by the media rather than by the police? And the problem about that, there are problems about being interviewed by the media before you're interviewed by the police, as we've seen by people who have come forward and said that they were abused by politicians. When they were interviewed by the media first, it was a lot easier to rubbish their claims or, but not just that, there are also legal issues. Because if you've said all this publicly, how are we then going to get you into a dock and say it? You can't because then they'll then say this is all played out in the public sphere. It's it's not a fair hearing. There are many reasons why it made sense for him to do that interview, but it backfired. But as I said, and I'll stand by my guns, that Prince Andrew is is not going to be indicted for anything. I'm I'm pretty certain of that given the you know the stuff that I you know I've not talked about everything within the palace and what happens there, but given what I know about the royal household and the way mechanics work and the way the establishment works. Cause let's not forget. I was part of that establishment at one stage and I was doing their bidding as people would say, you know, I was turning a blind eye. Y yes, I was, you know, that's, that's fine and dandy. But, but from what I know, I can honestly say that I cannot see Prince Andrew, uh, for the reasons I've given as well, obviously speaking publicly, if you're looking at being arrested for something, you're hardly going to go on, on telly and start talking about it because obviously that's, that's your story's for the whole house. And if you're going to change your story, it's too late. Virginia said she had sex with Andrew three times. And the third occasion, even though she was 18, it was an orgy with underage girls who had been procured from Eastern Europe and they could barely even speak English. Mm -hmm. And Epstein was boasting that these are the easiest girls, you know, to, to get in his, in his sick manner. Um, so basically she said that Prince Andrew was in an orgy with her, with, with children. Even with that level of allegation, mm -hmm. do you think nothing will ever happen? So, Andrew, do you think the royals are completely untouchable? Pretty much. Isn't that awful? I mean, pretty much. It, it's awful. I mean, I just... This stuff keeps me awake at night. <laughs> the, the sheer injustice of how somebody can steal a bottle of water from Lidl and be banged up for six months, right? And you can go around and you can be raping children and you can be murdering children. And I do believe this has all taken place and nothing is done about it. I do believe that the royals are above the law. Yeah. Uh, London is built up of, I think it's 26 boroughs. And each borough in London, London's unique in as much as it's not one policing district, it's 26 policing districts. And when you look at the canals, they're so old, the boundaries, the old parish boundaries are built up around the canals and the River Thames. So if you take sort of like where Wapping is, that's in the borough of Tower Hamlets. But if you go into the middle of the river, you're then in the borough of Southwark. So the River Thames is tidal and moves about too fast, but the canals don't and canal boats are all right to live in. So certain parts of London, there was um, a collection of paedophiles. So you'd get them around Hackney, uh, Southall. And when I overlaid a map on top of it, I found out that these were areas where three boroughs were meeting. So the canal boat, in effect, could be here. And then literally a canal is only three metres wide, some of them. You cross over on your, your 27th day 
onto the other side in another borough and legally you're not going to get caught. The paedophile unit had got information from a prison, again had got information from the prison, that uh, in order to get away with being released and not becoming a, you know, um, a registered sex offender, uh, what you've got to do is you've got to get a canal boat. And if you get one in London, they ain't going to touch you. And kids like boats. Mm. And what do they do with special needs respite? They take them on boat trips. Mm. I mean, we had one one of our paedophiles that we was watching. He'd got himself on a boat that would take kids kids um, <gasps> day outs from Camden to the, to the zoo. And he was put in charge of toilet duties. Mm. I mean, you, you couldn't make it up. Um, so what, what the paedophile unit said to me, look, we're, we're going to get you seconded to us, right? We're going to sponsor you. Uh, we've got two sex offenders. We think there's probably another couple. If you can find another couple in the next couple of months, brilliant, we'll keep this going. Anyway, in the first month, I found 90. It, it was quite easy, to be honest. British Waterways are the, the biggest landowner in the country and they had a phenomenal database, so I had access to their database. I got their names and their names and dates of birth, and that's how I found out they were paedophiles, and it was just incredible. And then I started cultivating informants, you know, and it was amazing how many of them were helping out special needs kids, oh. kids from kids' homes. Well, what happened then was that um, names started cropping up of certain people, and these are names that have come out on the pie list, which has come out, the paedophile information exchange. Uh, they were involved in boats, mainly around the Richmond area. And and, and they've come out uh, just sort of subsequently in the press, um, uh, uh, I think linked to people like Peter Heyman and, and things like that. So th these names started cropping up and that was it. It got shut down. And I came into work one day and my... Chief Inspector said, uh, ever so sorry, but your, your secondment's finished. I went, well, well no, it hasn't. I've been promised that I'm here. And I built my life around it, my schedule around it, and, you know, and everything. And he said, uh, no, no, it's come to an end. And I said, oh, come on, be fair. And he went, look, it's come from my up, John. It's come from my up. There's nothing I or anyone can do about it. We're grateful. We can never thank you enough for what you've done. But unfortunately, these things happen. Right now, the strange thing is, there was a very um, when I say senior, senior inexperienced detective from the paedophile unit that was working with me, and he said, "John, this happens all the time." And he said, "We've had and said the name of an MP. We've had him twice. This MP, prominent Tory MP." You're allowed to say that name. Uh, well, he is dead. Um, oh, what his initials are LB. I'll leave it at that. Anyway, so twice that you know that they had him, and on both occasions the plug was pulled. And he said it will happen again, and it will happen to you. And sure enough, it did happen to me. So this was the first time I realised a so-called conspiracy exists, and it comes from high up. All the time, it comes from high up. And one day was out, and there was a there was a little girl there. And I was told by this other woman that there were a couple of young girls at work in the area. And because she was on heroin as well, she looked a hell of a lot younger. And I, I, I got her, but we would deal with them as victims. And I was told, and this, this is part of my statement, to get rid of her because she had scabies that she would contaminate the car. And then you'd have to take them back to the police station and put them in a certain room. That would need cleaning as well because she's got scabies. She's a pain in the ass. She'll only be doing it tomorrow. Tell her to F off to the 14 year old girl. And I started looking into this and started recruiting some of the girls as informants strictly for the child prostitution side of it. These kids that have been in care homes have had a shitty life to start with. And when they came forward and speak out, they'd just be cast as a liar. So they'd pull it on their record. And with the new legislation they brought in in 2003, the Criminal Justice Act, a bad character, they can use that information. So whenever they, they come forward in later life, say, I was abused by this person, that person, and I totally believe them, they're discredited instantly by the court. And it's done deliberately. Anyway, I went up to the, this kid's home in Cambridgeshire and I sat down with this, this little girl. And she was a bit of a horror. 
but God bless her, she's dead now. She died in mysterious circumstances um, and still a kid at the time when she died. I went to see her and she and she started explaining. She said, look, this, this one woman, street name of Foxy, uh, is pimping me out. We knew Foxy. We, she'd been about on the street for a long time. And it was all around the Sussex Gardens area of Paddington. And she said she pimps me out for crack. Sometimes she gives me money. Sometimes she takes me to posh restaurants. So one restaurant, I know they get £2,000 for me. And another place, I'll go to a crack house and she'll get 20 rocks for me. And she gives me some of the rocks. And she was a little crackhead herself. And she said, but she gets me to get my friends involved. And one of my friends is involved and I'll give you her name. And, and I'll tell you of others. So, uh, And then she started introducing me to other girls and other girls and other girls and other girls. And there was one girl, and this, this girl was a traveller. She was nine years old when it was happening. Nine years old at the relevant time. And it was just horrific. And it was everywhere. Now, there was a judge that was involved. Um, and this judge was involved with, with this girl, Foxy. Um, and there was... We never got the name, but there was rumours of a senior police officer. There was someone uh, that was high up in the BBC in the uh, arts and music department. Um, and the venues, they would range from upmarket Curzon Street Mayfair restaurants, which are the, you know, the top echelons of, of, of that sort of scene. You know, it, it was it was massive, but um, there was a barrister involved. Oh, it, it, was, it was just, it was, it was going mad, you know, it was going, in, in the end, we were dozens and dozens of kids. They were coming forward by the day. It was hemorrhaging. This girl from South, or a social worker, said, uh, John, we've been going to your unit for 10 years. For the last decade, we've been pleading with you. She said, we've got girls that are turning up, young girls, kids. One girl, she's got so many cysts and abscesses inside her vagina that she oozes when she comes in. She is dying. She said, there's one lad. He has been pimped out. He is in the latter stages of HIV AIDS. He is dying on his feet. He is still being pimped out. Your unit don't even turn up. She said, you've got to help us. You have to help us. So I wrote a very, very uh, concise and factually based report, two paragraphs. Uh, I handed it in and to the intelligence unit. Within an hour, I got a detective inspector screaming down the phone at me get to see me now so I went in there and he starts what we call fuck chucking who the hell do you think you are you effing you can't put things like this and he said we you know you're demeaning the unit we've been doing this for decades and you know who do you think you are and it turned out that all the these reports of these kids from the care homes whenever the kids went missing and turned up in red light areas were archived and I found these reports went back a long way so known about it for uh, well, at least 15 years they knew about it anyway he start, He said you're off the case and I went well, you, you can't kick me off I said this has become my life um, he went you're off it it's shutting down and he, he just belittled everything so I then went to see the chief superintendent and sat down and I said uh, Governor I don't know what I've done wrong I, I thought this was going to be a good thing I, I really thought I'd given them the goose the shit in the golden egg here you know and he told me he said what the hell have you done he said this is going to F us and I said the F word before but I don't keep saying it but he said I want, this will F us past present and future you have no idea how deep this goes he said if you mention a word of this outside of this room he said you will be thrown to the walls and he said you will lose your home your children and your job he said you've got no idea who and what you're dealing with so that showed me how big this was, right? And uh, I said, so that was it. I was off and I was scared. And I generally was scared. And of course, I'd seen it before with the canal thing. Uh, and, I, and I was told by the senior couple, look, this is what they'll do to you. And, and I knew it was political. And he said, you've got to take an, have an undertaking that you never, ever look into child prostitution again. I remember first going there, I was taking, talking to the detective sergeant that runs it, and I said, uh, do you have any problems with, with um, child prostitution? She went, oh, no, 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 none. And But she used to go to meetings with the social services about the child prostitution. She said, and um, 
no, nothing's been, she did it for two years, nothing's been highlighted. So we've got a detective sergeant saying that in that borough, that inner London built up borough, that there are no problems with child prostitution, categorically saying it, and then saying that there was an officer dealing with it for two years, never come across one case of it. She said, you'll go to a meeting. So he said, it's a jolly. So if you go to a meeting, what you call job or not, go to meetings, go home. So I know now why this girl did it. So anyway, so with that in mind, she pisses off this this sergeant uh, and I get the phone and I ring up social services. I, I knew someone else. I said, look, couldn't fax me for a list of the care homes. But it turns out that Haringey's got more care homes than any other borough that in the UK. It, it's got 26 or it did have back then. And I got faxed through this list, care homes, right? Uh, with the phone numbers. And this is how it works, Sean. So I've been told two years, not a problem. I get the list and I start off care home number one. So I dialed the number, picked the phone up, introduced myself, said no one's in any trouble here. I'm looking at this problem with children and prostitution. Goes quiet. I said, look, I'm here to work with you, my friend, you know, and a lot of the poor staff that work there, that, you know, it's not them, you know. And on the whole, they had five children. So I said, how many children you got? I said, five. I said, how many of them do you lose at a weekend due to prostitution? He went, three. Right. And honestly, that was a time scale. Bang. So two years, F all. In that four or five minutes, three kids. Right. And that went on consistently. Right. So by the end of three days, I'd done all of them. I had 50 kids. So I then held a meeting. So I got all these support agencies and, and everything else, brought them all in and social services. And I said, well, we need to sort this out. And I started talking to some of the kids and some of them started working with me. Brilliant. And they started naming places where they were taken and everything else. And then there was uh, a leading children's charity. Uh, the woman in charge of um, trafficking this term they use trafficking and I want to go on about that in the short if I may uh, turned around and said you're treading on toes you think you know everything she said we've been looking at this for a long time there's been a unit set up there's a cop already looking at it there's a superintendent looking at it you're to back down now and then a senior social worker in charge of child exploitation or whatever she turned around and she said what the fucking hell you done John she said, we've got an output in 50 care plans. I said, but you knew about these kids. She said, yeah, but while they were making money, they were quiet. You know, and that's how it went on. And of course, then what happened, I, I, I had to go and see a superintendent and I was panicking, thinking, oh shit, they're going to have me now. Um, he told me to back away, said this detective's looking at it. I spoke to her, went and met her, lovely girl. And she said, I've been to two meetings. I've never even met any of the kids. How the hell could I deal with that? That was one borough in London. And and these kids go missing. So they'll go missing on a Thursday and they'll come back on a Monday. They're usually worse for the wear through drugs and through sexual activity and coming down from it. And, you know, so there'll be all health problems. Some of them will be bleeding. They'll all be high and they'll be kicking off until the middle of the week when they'll be looking forward to going out and getting their drugs again and then going back out to work again. And so when they say about kids going missing, yes, they go missing, but they come back. Now, the police units, they've got the missing persons unit, which take records of this. So they knew about it. That would be given to the child protection units. They knew about it. And if it was prostitution, it'd be given to the vice unit as well. Yet none of them were talking to each other. The vice unit wouldn't come to the meetings. So they knew about these kids, these failings, and did nothing. And all the time, money was being made, money. And then, of course, when you look at these kids that were involved in it, girls and boys, they would just start getting involved in crime because there'll be antisocial behaviour, there'll be a lot of violence because there's a lot of anger, you know, and then that will lead to the Class A drug addiction, which then goes way to the prostitution, to the, the street prostitution, to the shoplifting, the robberies and everything else. We, we've got kids, uh, people in prison, the majority are coming from abused backgrounds. Not all of them, but they are. So really, I was right in what I was looking at. Now, I weren't the first and many have looked at this, but we all get shut up. We all get shut up. Now, of course, lo and behold, I moved. I moved and I'm sent now over to the west side of London, you know, and this keeps happening and keeps happening. And in the end, I did blow the whistle officially and I made I had already done it 
but then I made allegations of corruption and I made sure my youngest was a little bit older and they couldn't really take my kids off me because I knew that they'd come for me. I made allegations of corruption against senior officers saying they'd deliberately covered it up. So John Wedger um, was somebody that I kind of wanted to help get that message out on social media. So I interviewed John and then we kind of started interviewing people all around the country and running a Facebook page. And I was boosting a lot of these posters. It was doing very well. I mean, we were getting kind of a million, a million hits a month and um, lots and lots of views. And then people were um, coming forward and saying, well, I want to get my story out. Michael contacted us through that page. John went to interview Michael Tarragher in January so it was less than a year ago, January 2019. He was given £10,000 in compensation from Lambeth Council. It was called a harm's way payment for the abuse he suffered as a child. Now, with that £10,000, he spent £4,000 on publishing a book about his life story. It was called The Uncouth Lout. Now, he then gave that book away and donated some money, asked for donations and gave the money to charity. He had no interest in making money. He just wanted to get his story out. We were taken into um, care under the 1948 Children's Act, where the authorities had full legal and parental rights. We went, we'd taken all three on the same day to Boreham Wood, to what was charmingly known as family home. This was kind of kids home, but allegedly run on family lines. The abuse then started on a regular basis. And when I say regular, three, four, five times a day. And then being passed around, taken to aunties and uncles in various places. And there was nothing I could do. I didn't know that it was abuse, but it was hurting. I was hurting. I couldn't go to school because my backside was bleeding at times. And I used to get beaten, hurt, beaten with a wooden spoon, which they made me go and get. You know, every word. I had nothing, no toys, no nothing. And my brother and sister were kept away. Oh, this went on for some time. Abused every day. There is an eight millimeter film of where they wanted me, well they did, they filmed me doing things to my sister, but things I didn't understand. Oh Christ, it was hundreds. I was taken to Eastbourne. I was taken to London. I was taken to Pimlico, to the three aunties house. You know, I was being sold. So this was a pedophile Le ring. Oh yeah. Christ, yeah. Taken to the meat rack in Piccadilly, which still exists today, in fact. I went back with Signo, my pal, and we drove down a couple of years ago because I, I went to Lambeth to confront Lambeth. And um, we went down and I said to Signo, his name's Ian, I said, look, I'm gonna show you something. And it was the tube station, but the wimpy bar has gone. Playland, the arcade has gone. But I said, that is where they used to stand us up and people used to come and pick us up. Not just me, there was lots and lots of children. Because you have to remember, post-war Britain, there were thousands of kids who had nobody, right? The parents had either been killed, bombed out, or just disappeared. And it was a different world, a total, total different world. And it, it was kind of, um, Strange, if you disappeared, who the hell was going to know you'd gone, you know? It, it was a strange, strange world. Uh, we had no one to complain to. How outrageous is this, that this man, this poor man, who was sexually raped, anally raped, as a child from the age of four, almost every day, now gets £10,000 in compensation in his late 60s, and he spends nearly half of that on trying to get his story out. What am I doing as a journalist? What are my colleagues, professional journalists, doing by not covering these stories? And I felt um, 
this huge, huge rage, righteous anger. I thought, I have to do something. We have to get his story out. There were times when I was taken away for weekends and just passed around in a house. You know, I'd wake up in different beds. And th this went on in the kids' homes. The kids' homes in London, your Shirley Oaks, your Hollies, Liscard Lodge, Stanford House, were hotbeds of paedophilia. The people who were doing the abuse were wealthy, suited people. But they were certainly managerial people, you know, civil servants, welfare officers, etc. It wasn't just the working class who were involved in this. This, this was high up people, police officers, judges, and that ilk of people, MPs. And I didn't know who he was at the time, was Edward Heath, who I was introduced on the boat as Uncle Teddy. You know, and I didn't, Teddy, who bloody hell's Teddy? You know, and it didn't occur to me for years. If he was alive today, they would question him under caution. So they believe, they know, they know exactly what he was. This was a guy who was single, was a choir master, <laughs> says it all. You know what I mean? So he's around boys all the time. And I'm not going to say he was a nasty piece of work because he didn't beat me up, you know. They asked me on the boat, go swimming, go naked, right? And I did it, I loved it going naked. But afterwards he took me into the little cabin, the saloon on this thing, where he dried me, you know, and um, fiddled about and kissed me willy and all that nonsense and had me do the same to him. and. Really, it was a case of, well, if I don't do it, I'm in the shit, yeah? If I do do it, I might get a fag and half a crown. And that's what happened. I might have got half a crown off him and a fag. I got, well, I had my own roll-ups, which I wasn't allowed to have at the time, but I had them because it was school holidays. So I just sat on the arse end of the boat and had a roll-up. Mike Veal is a friend of mine. Mike Veal was the Chief Constable of Wiltshire. He is still coming under attack to silence him because of what he brought out about Ted Heath, the investigation that went on regarding Ted Heath. You know, and he's, he's staunch in his approach, Mike Veal, and he's gone on to Sky News and said, I am 120% certain that, that Ted Heath was a paedophile. Not surprisingly, lots of people attacked the Chief Constable of Wiltshire Police at that time, Mike Veal, for having the courage to dig deep into this issue and not simply let it go away. 
He was attacked, accused of everything under the sun. It was quite desperate, you could see, to silence him. Uh, but he held on and he produced this good and revealing report of the allegations against Heath of both child sex abuse and also of satanic abuse. So let's take both Leon Britton and Ted Heath. Ted Heath was always cruising gay areas, you know, even when he was a backbencher, then a cabinet minister, and then in the forefront of, of parliament. So he, everything he did, everyone around him would have been vetted to a high standard. So how is that man with such a questionable sexual history and a proclivity for the like, and he did the, the ponchons, whatever, for young boys, which is what he had, especially those from the care homes, why was he allowed the the, the prime position, the premiership of, of politics? Ag again, Leon Britton, again, it, it, we got 634 MPs, right? How often do you hear in a paper about the MP for, for Witness being involved in it, the MP for Loughborough, the MP for... for Cornwall, you don't. You hear the same ones all the time. It's the same ones consistently. We are hearing time and time again. There was um, two coppers uh, that were based in um, number 10. Uh, back then, now it's part of the diplomatic thing. I think it was back then, it was just parliamentary protection or something. Um, uh, one of them was an ex-military guy and they were removed because they kept seeing young boys were taken up into Ted Heath's residency three times a week and one of them turned around and confronted Ted Eve because they thought if they tell their bosses he said well what are they going to do about it they're going to they're going to attack us and it will carry on so he, he confronted him and I actually gave this information to the Home Secretary's office I gave it to him and I turned around and said sir this stops and it stops now and he said fair enough it did stop for two weeks and then it continued and then it continued Ted Heath um, I was told about him by a series of people who um, most of the people that had Ted Heath abused, the children, that they, they didn't survive because Ted Heath uh, was at a very famous face. Um, you know, the more people he abused who stayed alive, the, the dodger it gets for his survival. And so he used to, he, they used to be killed, uh, most of them. Uh, but I was told by a number of people, uh, and it built up over a period of time, of um, what um, what he did. And there was, I won't say what it is, because for obvious reasons. But when Wiltshire Police um, and um, the Chief Constable at the time, who was has been not Chief Constable anymore, they kind of, you know, um, they they got him removed eventually because you don't take these people on if you're in the system uh, and survive. But um, he um, or, or the investigation team mentioned something when they were investigating Heath that there was something that he did that was kind of, I would say, very, very strange and that gave them sort of confidence that these people were telling the truth because what they were describing was fantastic. And you really couldn't make it up. And you certainly couldn't make it up across several different people unconnected with each other. Well, I, I know what that was because uh, I was told by um, some of these people who claimed to be abused by Heath what he did when he was abusing them. And you absolutely could not make it up. If you, if you, if we, if you sat here for, uh, you know, the next hour saying, "Is it this? Is it that?" I just say no every time because you wouldn't get it because it's so fantastic. Um, and that gave me confidence as well, because they were describing this particular way he did things that was so outrageous and yet incredibly consistent across all these these people, formerly kids. Um, that I was confident enough to go with it. And there was a journalist, well, what passes to be, uh, passes to be a journalist on the Isle of Wight, who when The Biggest Secret came out in uh, 1998, um, she called Ted Heath, uh, who was still had set, he was still in, in the parliament for another seven years after this, 
um, and um, and read him the passage. And all he said was, David Icke must be mad. That was it. And I, you see what I've accused him of? Um, but never went anywhere because they don't want this stuff in court. The Reigns list is, uh, it's about, it's a list of people, very famous people, people in the media, actors, actresses, politicians, etc., etc., who names who had been given to Joan, who were said to be involved in satanic ritual abuse or the sexual abuse of children. It's an extensive list. Um, I don't know uh, the veracity of it, but having met Joan, I think that she would have compiled it in an extremely forensic manner. And what she told me was that she wasn't prepared to put anybody's name down on that list unless several independent people said the se who didn't know each other said the same thing. What Joan was able to ascertain, which was very scary indeed, and in fact, it still makes me feel shivery to even recall it, was at least five of her children who had been sent to her claiming to have been involved in some sort of abuse, had traumas, they named Edward Heath. But they said something really curious about Edward Heath. Um, and none of them knew each other. And that's why I believe what she had to say. And what these children said was that when Edward Heath abused them, he used what was like a mechanical hand because he couldn't bear to touch them with his own hands. Now, five children said that independently. What are the chances? And that, I believe, formed a huge part of those revelations, the fact they were independent witnesses that, that, that convinced Wiltshire Police there was something worth pursuing. Uh, what, one other thing, very quickly, what, one of the little tricks they do is when, when they're really in trouble over paedophilia and stuff, or whatever, stuff like that, they'll produce someone who um, doesn't tell the truth. Um, they'll name the people that others are naming truthfully, and then there'll be explosives of fraud. And in doing that, they uh, seek to, and it works, they seek to discredit all those people who are telling the truth. So the Carl Beach story, I mean, that all came out sort of two or three years ago and uh, he was deemed a credible witness and he was working with, you know, he was being interviewed by journalists, former mainstream media journalists who worked for a publication called Exaro and they deemed him to be credible and so did Tom Watson. Um, uh, it turned out, you know, he, he gave his story about being sexually abused by VIPs. So, and then, then he was taken to court and found to be a liar and a fraudster and also a paedophile um, and he got eight years. Well, why didn't this come out sooner? Um, and it's, it was all over the papers, you know, when he did get locked up. It was everywhere. So I had a problem with Carl's, Carl's well, Nick's prop stories from the beginning. Because they came through an outfit called um, Exaro. And Exaro surfaced just after the Jimmy Savile, or actually just shortly before the Jimmy Savile revelations. And Xaro's stock in trade was to take people's accounts and publish them all over the place. And they sold uh, their stories to Sunday newspapers and TV and uh, 60 Minutes in Australia. They made a, a lot of money, a lot of money. But it wasn't journalism as we know it. And I had a lot of problems with it because I felt, and I said about it right from the beginning, I said, if you keep putting out stories that are not fact-checked, it means that as soon as one is discredited, that everybody else will be discredited. And I said that 2013. I said it publicly, I said it on TV, I said it on radio, I've said it all over the place. All of the newspapers and all the commentary was around how the fact that this Westminster paedophile ring was all fiction, apparently, it's all fiction, just because of this one particular situation with Carl Beach. And it just feels like they're insulting our intelligence. And I knew there was a problem. I knew there was a problem. And I, I said to people from the get-go, out of all the people who are surfacing, he's the one I have the most problem with. And I said it repeatedly because it just wasn't, it wasn't making sense. 
I'm not saying he's lying. I don't know that. What I'm saying was that he was so easy to discredit because like lots of child abuse victims, he wasn't able to think with clarity. He was over emotional. These are natural attendant behavior patterns of people who have been abused. But the problem is, if you're going at it with just the aim of getting a story out, you're not taking care of how something's said, how much you had to push them to get to that point, and it, it wasn't proper journalism. Lord McAlpine, who had been previously accused of being a paedophile and is now dead, had quite accurately said in his book that what you need to do is you need, and I say this in paedophiles in Parliament, I think you're probably aware of the, the point that I'm talking about, and that is what you need to do is you need to basically isolate somebody, you need to prove that what they're saying is wrong, and then the rest of the story will be discredited, which is what has happened. You cannot get a story about a suspected paedophile in parliamentary circles on air or anywhere near it for love and money after Carl Beach. That's done. And that then became the narrative. So Carl Beach was inevitable. It was inevitable. It's done. The story's done now in the mainstream. They will, I don't know an editor, and I have good friends in mainstream, I don't know an editor who will touch a story. And I go to them with good stuff. I, I, can, I can link them up to people who will, you know, will take lie detector tests, will do, you know, go through it all, are prepared to be forensically examined, but nobody will listen to them, what they have to say. But the media can no longer listen to them, well, when I say can no longer, has taken an active choice that these people are attention seekers and they're all of the same calibre of Kyle Beach and should just probably be ignored because they're wasting a lot of money at a time of austerity. And now what you're seeing is people like Daniel Janner, which is um, Lord Janner's son, coming forward and saying we've got to stop these people from coming forward. So virtually um, saying that anyone who comes forward now has to be treated as a liar. Um, and you, can you imagine what that's doing to the victim and survivor community? They must be absolutely screaming. We are dealing with evil people that not just want to have sex with children, but want to cover up for their friends and colleagues that are doing likewise. In order for us to get anything changed in Parliament, we have to go through these filters and they sit as gatekeepers and don't allow it out. But Geoffrey Dickens was a Conservative MP who had been given certain information and he was able to pull together a series of files in which he cited people in parliamentary circles who may be abusing children. And he handed those to Leon Britton, or at least he handed one of those files to Leon Britton. Now, Leon Britton, if anybody knows, was also accused right up until his death of being a paedophile. Um, and certainly there were accusations of him involved with Elm Guest House in southwest London. We certainly know that Cyril Smith was at Elm Guest House. There were other politicians at Elm Guest House and there was abuse taking place at Elm Guest House. Um, and so Geoffrey Dickens compiled these files, gave it to Leon Britton, the Home, of, Home Secretary of the day, and essentially nothing was done of it. He was ridiculed. He had his office broken into. He, also, Jeffrey Dickin had done everything he could to try and expose these people, but they, they did what they always do. They portrayed him as a nutter. He's crazy. He's got mental health problems. Like they, they said because he was putting through the foster care system, that must have messed with his mind. They did everything they could to tar him other than be prepared to look at what was really taking place. I said to an editor about six years ago, the British people are not ready to be exposed to the misdeeds of our establishment because we build 
our lives on ideas and foundations that we take for granted. Most people are, would be horrified to discover the level of corruption that takes place in government, in local council, in any parts of the establishment. Um, and so they have to protect themselves. They literally have to protect themselves. I mean, this is what politicians do. They have to protect their party, which is why Margaret Thatcher surrounded herself with paedophiles. I mean, even her own assistant was a paedophile who Edwina Curry noted in her own book that uh, Sir Peter Morrison was a noted pederast. Margaret Thatcher, her political advisor, right, was a bloke called Peter Morrison, who was classed as a dangerous paedophile. He was actually classed. He had convictions, I think, to do with raping boys. I know uh, Barry Strevens, who was Margaret Thatcher's personal bodyguard. I have worked with the men who worked with Barry, and I have heard Barry personally say that he told Margaret Thatcher that Morrison was having parties at the weekend in his house in Cheshire with young boys and she did nothing about it. In fact, she then followed that by making him a sir. So, and she promoted him. She promoted him within her party. I, look, Jimmy Savile spent at least 12 Christmases at Chequers. You do not get to spend time with the Prime Minister unless you have been seriously vetted by the security services. I think Thatcher must have known. She must have known. I can't see how she couldn't know. And if she didn't know, then that's almost remiss on her part. Because she certainly was informed. And it's up to her then to explore it further. She was certainly informed that one of her closest aides was messing around with young boys. I think that would be enough information for most people to pursue. Theresa May was given, she had 114 files of, of high up child abuse was given to her, right? All went missing. Mm. Jeffrey Dickens, the MP, uh, he gave all these files on, on ritualistic abuse to Leon Britton. It went missing. Barbara Castle, who was the leading peer for, for the Labour Party, openly stated that Leon Britton should not be trusted with any information regarding child abuse, should not be trusted. This was one of the peers in Parliament, high up in the British government, is saying that our Home Secretary should not be trusted. And he was given files and it all went missing. You're seeing it with the care homes, with, with Michael Tarragher. What happened to his file? Oh, they had a flood. Or they have a fire. It happens all the time. It's consistently happening. I have sat down, like I said to you before, with the with the assistant editor of the Daily Mail, and he said to me, we knew about Leon Britton, but we couldn't do anything. Every time for 10 years, we've been trying to put a story out and it just doesn't go anywhere. I mean, Lord Janner was an outrageous situation. He's now dead, right? He was 33. Young boys have he, said. He played the senile card, didn't he? Absolutely, absolutely. He went from, in December, turning up every day to the House of Lords and collecting his £300 a day, right? To the minute that they then decided they were the police were going to start investigating him, suddenly he didn't attend the House of Lords anymore. To Janna was in uh, child, child home, children's homes in Leicester. He's a Leicester MP for many years. 30 plus accusations. They quashed that in Parliament. They And Keith Vaz was very much involved in the quashing of that in Parliament. Um, and they gave him Jana parliamentary privilege to basically absolve himself of anything. I'm completely innocent. These rumours are awful. And that was it. And what was even worse is in parliamentary privilege, it doesn't give journalists an opportunity to ask questions. So Jana was able to say that. It went down in Hansard and that was it. And Keith Vaz was very much behind that. And Keith Vaz, let us not forget, is somebody with a whole lot of secrets. A whole lot of secrets. That's another Mr. Teflon. The only thing we know about Keith Vaz so far is that he likes Eastern European male prostitutes. That was on the front pages of Sunday papers. We know that. But we also know that the Sun intimated that it was Keith Vaz who liked young boys and called them ragamuffins. So allegedly, allegedly.
paedophile information exchange mission was to legalize sex with children and that's that and there's really and they use lots of nice flowery wording about it about the beauty of love between adults and children and everything but it was really about legalizing sex with children and harriet harman most famously said that she wasn't aware that there was any great long-term damage done to children who had who engaged in sexual relations with adults and she is now obviously very very senior in the labor party pie paedophile information exchange it had 370 members their members included an army major someone head up high up in the boys brigade um, there was also to do with christian youth workers these were men that were campaigning for sex with children and and, and to legalize um, sex with an under 10 year old child mm. uh, and they classed it as consensual and loving right they were funded by the British government for three years and they were given the protection of the NCCL, which has now gone on to become this group called Liberty. You know, and Harriet Harman, she, she doesn't even apologise for it even now. She said it was just an oversight. They were taking money from Pi. They even allowed Pi to give a talk at one of their national conferences at, at, at the London School of Economics. Um, and so that was the paedophile information exchange, which is throughout the establishment. They... They, they appeared to disband, but they didn't. What they did was they went underground. They still had their people in Parliament and in the establishment who were helping. And, and what we've seen now is a resurfacing of them, in a way, under the idea of queer theory. And queer theory has become extremely popular. Um, and as I say, I've spent this year making a film about gender. And queer theory is obviously is that it's now LGBTQ. So that's queer. Queer theory is support it's an academic theory it is highly unpleasant about you know it's far too complex for me to go into now but but the bottom line is there is definitely an opening for relations between adults and children within it right and the 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 the, the, the boundaries and the barriers being erased as well and bringing down the age of consent right now when I say this is in the establishment I'm not messing around okay I will give you a real life situation that has just happened involving the National Society for the Protection of Children, right? NSPCC. In the summer of this year, a, uh, a trans-identified male called Munro Bergdorf, a trans woman, um, announced that they had become an advisor at NSPCC. Well, I went mad because I know about Munro's history this is somebody who you only need to do a cursory search on Google and you will find image after image, which is pornographic. And this was an advisor to NSPCC. Anyway, we made a complaint, said, what on earth is Munro Bergdorf doing advising children? And they release Munro Bergdorf. But we went deeper and we discovered that the person who had brought Munro into NSPCC was a guy called, I believe, James Making. And James Making had published photos online of him in his rubber suit masturbating saying i'm at work in the toilet right he was at nspcc masturbating in the toilet in his rubber suit so these are people who are still around our parliament that we're still paying for who have questions to answer about the systemic and maintained abuse of children over many decades Utri and everything started as a consequence of the Jimmy Savile revelations of Tom Watson standing up in the Houses of Parliament and saying that he had intelligence that there was a paedophile ring linked to Parliament and David Cameron saying we will look into this and then you've got you, all the investigations came about you know YouTube's loads of them but Utri essentially went after all the 70s entertainers and I only laugh not because I think it's funny it's just because I can't believe that we keep sucking this up it's like Weren't we supposed to be looking at politicians? How did we end up with that lot? Do you see what I'm saying? It's like sacrificial lambs. Always, and it's not. It's not okay. They're literally that since 2012, there has not been one arrest, one conviction of a politician, and it even statistically, it's not possible that there aren't paedophiles walking around Parliament. Even statistically. But you cannot take 
um, the Andrew situation with Epstein in isolation from the royal family, Prince Charles in particular, connection to Jimmy Savile. So just let's take a breath and look at it again. Uh, we have a single family operating out of London and somehow one of them gets involved um, with a, a major paedophile and procurer of children for the rich and famous in the United States and further afield. And another one gets involved for decades as a close friend of Jimmy Savile in this country, who was a historic level paedophile and procurer of children for the rich and famous. Uh, just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. Are you having a laugh? Uh, but this is this is the whole thing, you know. Just just look. I mean, Savile was an inner bosom uh, buddy of the uh, inner circle of the royal family for decades. Brought in there. This is another coincidence, by the way. Nothing to worry about. Um, in the 1960s, by his own, in his own words, by um, Lord Mountbatten, who I've been pointing out for a long time was a paedophile. And of course, this year a book came out using um, information from Freedom of Information request to the FBI, where at the FBI documents we're talking about Mountbatten being a paedophile. So a, a paedophile takes a um, historic paedophile into the royal family, becomes a decades long friend of Prince Charles. And the same family and then have another um, uh, a, a brother, um, uh, Prince Andrew, who gets involved in the, one of the well, actually most high profile paedophiles and procurers of children in America. And we're supposed to think this is all a coincidence. Prince Charles had this really strong relationship with Jimmy Savile. Mm. I read Princess Di's book in her own words. And she said she thought Savile was creepy. The royals brought him in mm. to give marriage guidance to them. And there were reports given to the police over the years about Savile's activity, but it never came out until after he, he died. Do you think that there was a conspiracy to keep that concealed until after his death? Because he had these powerful relationships like what Prince Andrew had with Epstein. Yeah, I mean, you, there's always a chance that that um, if there's sensitive information appertaining to a senior politician or a member of the fa royal family, that it is, that is withheld or, or, you know, it's pushed pushed under because obviously again it all comes back to the threshold is in the public interest that's what they use public interest and then you've got PII public interest immunity which is what they if they don't want to give information out they'll, they'll hide behind that there's a lot of different things they can do covering up criminal offences I, I would say back in the 70s and 80s that was clear that when you look now at the sex scandals that are going on with paedophiles it was clear that those things did happen. Was Savile entering the palace under your watch? Was that yeah, a different I mean, era? I, no, he was. I, I remember him coming uh, a couple of times when I was there. And to be fair, he was quite funny. He was quite a funny person. He was quite amenable. So when you look at him, when you think, if you look at him there, if you saw him walking down the street, you think that's a sex case, wouldn't you? You know, in the shiny tracksuit and the little tiny shorts, you'd think he was a. You, he looks like a. You'd a see nonsense. it now, but back then yeah. we all grew up on yeah. Savile, didn't we? we thought he was funny, him, a caricature. You, you, you see him, you know, but he was quite funny, and we. We all liked him. To be fair, we, you didn't think he was a creepy character. But then that's the facade, isn't it? A lot of you know, a lot of paedophiles are the very same. They've got they've got a split personality, and for no one would have believed about Savile. And this is a problem a lot of their victims had when they were piping up. Who who was really going to believe them against you know Sir Jimmy? What the Savile situation was, because it came out in the public arena, it was a little doorway. And staggering, given that he was a record-breaking paedophile, staggering it may be for me to say, but it's true, a tiny doorway, because this thing is vast. And I do believe that Savile was a procurer of children. I think that was very much his role. If you actually look back at old footage, he's not hiding anything. He's literally, he was literally in plain sight. He's very clear. He's um, but I think that his job, he, he had too much access in parliament, um, parliament and royals. If you can walk into Buckingham Palace and you can just take in a, a child that you want to film and you just go to, you know, which he does, and which I mentioned in the documentary, and he like sees, and I don't know if you remember that clip, but it's very dodgy because he says to, when he realises that he's saying something a bit too open on a chat show, he starts to try and turn it into a, a joke and he, double, he, he doubles back, he comes back and he, he, he squashes his words. But what he's actually saying is that Prince Philip says, you know, put the kid away. 
That's what he says Prince Philip says. What? What? Bishop Ball was um, a member of uh, Archbishop Carey's. Uh, you know, he was, I think, the Bishop of Lewis down in Sussex in the south coast of the UK. And he was raping boys. And who was his best friend? Prince Charles. And this goes into the very, uh, the very top of society. The ratio of paedophiles and Satanists in the upper echelons of the societal hierarchy is vastly greater in the general population. It's a lot of the general population, but in um, the upper level, the ratio is ridiculous. And so you, you look at the Savile story and it, it was that window. So um, I remember Jimmy Savile as a kid um, and he was a disc jockey. They called him a disc jockey. He was a strange man. He had this white hair and he, you know, all that stuff. And he became Jim will fix it with kids and everything, you know. Um, and um, and he, he was a strange man. Then he kind of disappeared. And he got old and old and old. And what happened to him? Um, but it turns out that even though uh, he had no obvious uh, income stream after he dropped out of being a famous so-called entertainer. He, he had houses all over the place. He had loads of cars. He had a Bentley and all this stuff. Where's the money coming from? What was lost in the revelations about Jimmy Savile is the reason that he got away with it. He was a procurer of children for the rich and famous. That's how he got away with it. Uh, and he, he uh, they had to watch his back to watch their own. Um, and so he would provide children for these rich and famous people. This is why he, he, he was uh, on very friendly terms with Ted Heath. Then you look at the other area of that Savile story that's never been um, explored, which absolutely should be. And it is this. In, in Savile's own words, in the 1960s, Lord Mountbatten, a known paedophile, invites Savile, who's a disc jockey, into the heart of the British royal family. It's, why, it's how he became a close friend of Prince Charles, a, a close friend for a long time until they fell out of Prince Philip, and in the inner circle, including the Queen. Sorry, banging that. Um, and... Um, and he remained at, in that inner center of the, um, the circle, the inner circle of the royal family, right up to his death, basically. And a friend of Charles right up to his death. You can't cough anywhere near the Queen without the security forces know about it and special branch know about it. The police clearly knew, because they interviewed him a number of times, that Jimmy Savile was a paedophile. And he's allowed into the inner circle of the British royal family and Special Branch and MI5 are not screaming, what's going on? He's a paedophile. What, we, what, what are you doing allowing him in there? No, he's allowed, while being interviewed by the police from time to time over paedophilia, to be in the inner circle of the royal family. But they got away with it because the, the system watches its own back. You know, the, the rings are very, very um, efficient in the way they work. They are well honed. They have their backs watched. You know, one of the reasons they didn't, um, uh, they never got Savile, although there, there were some people that tried, um, is because he threatened legal action. And then there was a guy called Peter Morrison, MP in Chester, who was a close, close bosom buddy of Margaret Thatcher throughout her prime ministerial period and before she became leader of the Conservative Party, who was a known paedophile. Edwina Curry, a Conservative MP, in her diaries, said that um, she was worried, you know, in one of her diary entries, she was worried that Peter Morrison was going to be given a, a job by Margaret Thatcher that, 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 that might be damaging the Conservative Party because, of course, he's a known paedophile. And she says in the diary that um, Norman Tebbit, who was chairman of the Conservative Party, um, had, had talked to Peter, uh, um, to talk to the MP, Peter Morrison, 
about his paedophile activities, but but Peter Morrison promised to be discreet. So now we have it in Igwina Curry's own diary. The chairman of the Conservative Party knew this guy was a paedophile. And I, I, I remember the, da what, the former Daily Mirror editor saying they wanted to get Peter Morrison for his paedophilia, but he always, always threatened with them with um, legal action. So now you have a paedophile, Peter Morrison, who was a very close associate and supporter and bosom buddy of Margaret Thatcher. You have Lord McAlpine, who was the Svengali and money uh, uh, maker for the campaigns of Margaret Thatcher. And you had Margaret Thatcher, who was a close friend of Jimmy Savile, who was a close friend of the British royal family. We are, it's a cesspit, Sean, a freaking cesspit. And we have to have the bollocks to say so. There's a lot of Tory Conservative MPs have been exposed, like Leon Britton. Leon Britton was the youngest ever promoted um, MP to Home Secretary since Winston Churchill. At the age of 43 years old, he was given this position just a couple of clicks down from, from Prime Minister. Right? Leon Britton's name crops up time and time and time again, and I've heard it within the, the police environment that this man is heavily involved in young boys. He was stopped by his protection team um, in Victoria Station because he was trying to procure young boys. Because these, these boys were runaways you know, from care homes, from abuse within the family and would gravitate towards London and they would be picked up from train stations. Savile was picking them up from King's Cross. Victoria Station was another one, Charing Cross. These, these were hubs where these kids were coming. So we take Leon Britton and he would have been vetted. The vetting process would have been there. The um, intelligence services would have got involved, right? Yet nothing ever came out. Peter Heyman, he becomes Sir Peter Heyman. He was in a group, he worked with a bloke, he was in with a paedophile group. Peter Heyman was, was a member of PI. Um, now, Peter Heyman was head of MI6. He was the High Commissioner for Canada, and then he was head of MI6. So we've got MI6 giving out the D notices. And their boss is a paedophile or was a paedophile and he was known paedophile right now I want to give you an analogy I'll just go on about Peter Wright and Peter Wright was one of the UK's most senior social workers a paedophile a convicted paedophile he wrote a, 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 a thesis on how to look after children right how to look after children and that was still used up until the early 2000s as as the bible for social work and it was written by a paedophile i think people have to realize sometimes we don't need people to actually tell us in black and white the answer all we have to do is look at the actions now the actions are run it through no MP has ever been uh, um, arrested or tried for crimes against children. No member of the royal family, even though these rumours have been going on for a long time, and I would say they are far more than rumours. I would say that there is substantial evidence. So the actions are that the establishment, whatever establishment that is, British establishment, American establishment, whatever, will always gather round and protect itself. And it's time for things to change now. It's time for these stories to get out there. You know, and I always say this, to shine a light into the darkness where those stories of injustice and abuse have hidden for so long. There's a, an old expression that one of the suffragettes said, and that is courage calls to courage everywhere. And the moment that people start to speak out, it gives other people the courage to come forward and say their piece. What are you going to do about it to prevent this happening again? You see, this is my point about Operation Conifer. They've done a report on the investigation and the findings. It's on the internet. It costs one million pounds of taxpayers' money to do that investigation. The, the report has hardly been referred to by the government. 
it's been put on the back shelf and the government has instead gone on about Carl Beach. If the government was actually wanting to do something about VIP abusers, they would have followed up that report that they spent so much money on to act against other VIPs. That report in itself proves that VIP abuse exists. I mean, what the British public have got to do is wake up. They have to wake up. People want justice. And with justice comes healing. And now we are even slamming the door on justice and we are doing it deliberately. And this government is doing it deliberately. And MI5 are hugely complicit in it. Hugely complicit in it. Special branch are hugely complicit in it. And these inquiries are just gatekeeping the information. And it's got to stop.